Assalamu alaikum and good evening if you are from this part of the world, good afternoon if you're tuning in from the EU, and good morning if you are tuning in from the American continents. My name is Zishan Salahuddin and I serve as the director for the Center for Regional and Global Connectivity at Tabat Lab. I want to, warm, I want to give a warm welcome to all of you today for another uh, Tabat Lab Policy Roundtable. The topic for this evening, this time, is Afghanistan. Uh, this topic is very much a follow-up conversation to the Afghan Solution Summit, uh, a very comprehensive series of dialogues and solution-based conversation that was conducted by Tabat Lab back in January. In fact, several of the moderators of that particular con uh, conversation are with us here today. Um, speaking of which, we have a phenomenal panel of international experts um, that, are, that are with us today and that will be weighing in on the various issues uh, related to Afghanistan. Uh, and among them, first and foremost, uh, I want to welcome Mr. Sheriyar Fazli. Uh, Sheriyar is an author, uh, an essayist, a security analyst. Uh, he has worked for the International Crisis Group as their South Asia regional editor and senior analyst. Welcome, Sheriyar. Uh, we also have Dr. Harun Rahimi, who is an assistant professor of law at the American University of Afghanistan and a visiting professor of law at Bocconi University. His research includes rule of law, uh, arbitration, uh, uh, anti-corruption, Islamic finance, as well as migration. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rahimi. Uh, we also have Masuda Sultan with us here today. Masuda is an Afghan-American entrepreneur, um, uh, a memoirist and international human rights advocate. She is the founder of Unfreeze Afghanistan, a women-led campaign to support the uh, Afghan people's wish to live in peace and prosperity, uh, which is very much been the central focus of the Afghan Solution Summit and will be the focus of the conversation this evening. Welcome, Masuda. Um, I also want to welcome David Westenskov, um, the chief consultant for the Royal Danish Defense College, a uh, good friend. Uh, his, he researches and writes about counterinsurgency, counterterrorism in Afghanistan and Pakistan, speaks, writes uh, uh, quite frequently about regional and security issues, um, works on military capacity building as well as uh, uh, elimination and termination of long-term conflict. Uh, welcome, David. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have one other colleague. Um, I will introduce her once she joins. Uh, she's delayed for some reason, but I think this is a good starting point to jump into the conversation. I, I mentioned the Afghan Solution Summit. This is something that was conducted back in January by Tabad Lab. Uh, a report was released associated with it, and there were a range of recommendations that came out, but that too was four and a half months ago, uh, twice as long as the Taliban have been in power since August 15th in Afghanistan. And I felt that perhaps the best jumping point would be uh, to ask my friend Sheriyad if he can perhaps uh, weigh in a little bit on things that have changed since the summit, since January, major developments that have happened, and what has really changed for better or for worse. Well, thank you, Zishan, and thank you, Tabad Lab, for inviting me to be part of this panel. And it was a pleasure of mine to participate in a very marginal way in the January uh, summit. For me, it was extremely beneficial to hear from the experts that you had uh, convened. Now, uh, as you suggest, um, you know, in this fast-moving environment, uh, several very significant events have happened in the intervening four and a half months that have radically changed the conversation. Uh, before I get to those, uh, it's worth noting that the, um, that the famine that many stakeholders feared was ultimately averted and food security has improved in Afghanistan, um, uh, you know, and, and concerns have subsided. But that said, it's already mid-2022, uh, winter will be upon us before we know, and I don't think it's... Um, desirable or sustainable for Afghanistan to jump from humanitarian crisis to humanitarian crisis with the international community coming in to apply a band-aid and withdrawing. So, uh, you know, I think the one of the principal questions sort of guiding uh, us is um, at what are the prospects of moving from unconditional humanitarian assistance to conditioned economic and development assistance? Now, with respect to uh, the events that have, that have happened, I'd uh, identify three. We probably, we don't have enough time to go through all of them because uh, so much has happened. But uh, I'll start with uh, two that occurred in late February, one day apart. Uh, one was 
February 24th, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, which cons has consumed a lot of the uh, bandwidth in US and Western and indeed international uh, policy circles. Afghanistan has not completely faded from view, but it doesn't feel like the burning issue that it was before that. The next day, the US uh, Treasury announced General License 20. What this did was remove a lot of the sanctions related impediments to doing business in and with Afghanistan. So that now the only prohibited activity really is uh, engaging in a way that would directly materially benefit listed individual, individuals, sanctioned individuals. But if such an individual runs a ministry, for example, it's still okay to engage uh, with that ministry. So this is a pretty significant exemption to, an, to the overall sanctions uh, regime. I do think, however, that it's relevant that it happened so soon after the beginning of the Ukraine war. Because uh, while the uh, general license was issued, we didn't see a great deal of discussion or communication around it. And that could be, I mean, I, I have no evidence of a causal link, but that could be because attention was diverted. Uh, so what we're left with is that, you know, a situation where while the legal impediments have been lifted, what hasn't been lifted is uh, the, the, that chill, that sense of anxiety uh, among international banks to do business in Afghanistan. Afghanistan analysts and observers that I'm regularly in touch with uh, speak about how these banks still fear that engaging too much with Afghanistan could incur risks, penalties. Um, so the Afghan banking system is still completely cut off from the global banking system. Uh, and meanwhile, the central bank, uh, while it's, you know, it's $9 billion of its assets are frozen, uh, it still hasn't uh, been engaged and it, uh, it's unclear to what extent the Taliban want to and are able to run an independent and professional central bank. Now, the third event happened a month later in late March, which was the Taliban's reversal on an earlier decision to allow girls to attend secondary school. Um, now, uh, this is, um, you know, part of, it's, it's probably the fullest embodiment of a general erosion of women's rights and civil rights in Afghanistan. Girls' education is the litmus test. Uh, you know, the international community is not going to engage with Afghanistan at a deep level uh, without uh, seeing progress on this. Um, and we can argue the merits and demerits of that uh, position, but that's, um, you know, that's what it is. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's the Afghan people, unfortunately, that suffer. I'll conclude now with trying to interpret what that decision means. Um, you know, one of the unresolved questions amongst observers uh, ever since last August was to what extent the Taliban seeks uh, international and even broad domestic legitimacy and how willing it is to change some fundamentals to achieve that legitimacy versus you know, honoring this amazing victory that it achieved after a 20 year war. Um, for me, it symbolizes a few things. The fact that it was a reversal of an earlier decision suggests that while there might be some pragmatic voices within the Taliban in Kabul, ultimately the Kandahar leadership's word is law in case there was any doubt about that. But also that the, that leadership, the Kandahar leadership seems more inclined uh, to uh, accommodate the views of hardliners who feel that allowing girls secondary education uh, is a concession to the international community. It is in a sense of betrayal of this insurgency, what the Taliban fought for to distinguish itself from the Republic that it has defeated. So I leave us on this note that I think um, we should look at this decision and it should encourage a sense of sobriety in how much international pressure can actually change some fundamental, the fundamental character of this regime. Thank you, Shirya. That was a very comprehensive take on things that have transpired uh, since the summit. And 
Um, while I'm very grateful for your in-depth analysis, I do feel like if you had gone on for much longer, I wouldn't really have many questions left to ask the rest of the panelists. Uh, just two quick things here. I want to introduce uh, Sara Wahidi, who has joined us now. She is the founder and CEO of the Etasab app, uh, which, is, which provides sort of uh, real-time security, traffic, uh, as well as electricity uh, outage alerts, um, and the app is based inside of Kabul. She's a, a social development specialist and an entrepreneur uh, focused on bringing sustainable solutions um, for community needs, primarily through civic engagement and, 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 and technology initiatives. So uh, welcome, Sarah. Uh, I'm going to pivot a little bit uh, because I am cognizant of the fact that Masuda does not have uh, the entire length of time that we have dedicated for the conversation today to be with us here. Uh, Masuda, Rosie, picture no more. Um, as Shariat has also said, with the reversal of this particular decision, it's not the only uh, promise that was, you know, broken. There's the women's rights, uh, women's right to education and mobility, minority rights. Um, you know, after announcing a sort of a, a, a general amnesty, there have been revenge killings and extrajudicial punishments. Uh, media freedoms have been curtailed. Uh, there's a whole other conversation on the drug trade, which I will come back to Shariat a little bit later. Uh, I guess my question to you, Masuda, is how are you know citizens in Afghanistan right now bypassing perhaps some of these government blackouts to relay critical information across and outside of the country? Uh, how difficult has it been to triangulate information from inside of Afghanistan? Um, and really sort of anchor all of these points within the, the sense of the humanitarian situation that currently exists. And what kind of solutions um, need to uh, be put in place, especially considering the fact that the one-year anniversary is coming up, and that brings with it its own host of issues. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Tabad Lab uh, and, and yourself uh, for your ongoing commitment to covering um, Afghanistan. Um, and Sharia, you had an excellent summary of the broader issues. Um, you know, when when we met last, uh, there was more hope for uh, what the next steps would be of the new, of the interim ad administration. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, um, what happened with girls' education was a huge setback. I uh, uh, actually, a couple of days after that uh, announcement was supposed to be in Afghanistan, um, along with um, seven other women who were going for uh, uh, an American Women's Peace and Education delegation. And we had to make uh, the very difficult decision of whether to go or not to go. And, you know, I, 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 I think this is something parallel to what the international community is going through. Um, just the emotional toll of, of seeing and hearing about these high school girls unable to go to school made us wonder if we should be going to Afghanistan uh, or we should essentially boycott which is what the international community effectively did, which was boycott. Our decision ultimately was to go and to engage. And I think that was the right decision. And that is what we urge the international community to do. Because what happens when we isolate, um, uh, we think we're isolating the Taliban, but actually we're isolating the whole of Afghanistan. And without engagement, we're not going to be able to reach um, these people. It's just a matter of fact um, uh, that... Uh, this is the situation in the country. Um, we want a, a broader based government. Of course, we'd like to see more minorities and we'd like to see women in higher level positions. They are in some of the ministries, but we'd like to see them in, in higher level positions. We'd like to see girls' high schools restarted as soon as possible. When we went there, we met with the Ministry of Education um, and had an extensive discussion about what the challenge was. Um, and they, you know, across the board, literally everyone we met uh, every member of the government we met, um, and, and of course, civil society and others said, you know, we want education for our daughters and we want it to begin right away. Um, there were uh, uh, young women going to universities, um, so it doesn't really make sense to hold back the high school girls. Um, and so and, and since then, we've been hearing, as all of us have, um, that it's going to happen soon, that it's not a formal ban. But I think, as you pointed out, that was the litmus test uh, for the international community on Afghanistan. Now, um, uh, we still keep hearing that it will, uh, they will restart um, the high schools. Uh, and there are girls going to high schools in about four or five provinces um, to public schools um, uh, where, you know, the Taliban will say, well, we haven't stopped them. But, you know, there was a general order to stop. So where communities can push back and do push back, we're seeing that, uh, that it works. 
Um, and so um, if, if girls' high schools don't open up soon, um, I wonder if local communities will start to push back. Um, on the issue of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the famine was largely averted, but my worry is that we're going to face the same situation, if not potentially worse, uh, this winter. And the reason I say that is with the situation, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, the uh, uh, blockage of the exports of wheat with wheat prices rising, um, already wheat prices were rising um, and food prices were rising dramatically in Afghanistan, making uh, the purchase of food out of reach. 95% of Afghans don't have enough to eat. Um, uh, uh, over 50% are, are, are surviving on a, a one meal a day. And so um, when you look at the, the, you know, what's ahead for Afghanistan, you, I wonder, you know, the, there was an appeal out uh, for $4.4 billion dollars of humanitarian aid by the UN that was only um, half funded after lots of effort. Um, for a long time, it was only funded to you know, 10 and 12%, and then the UK stepped in and it was, it's was it been funded to half. Now, does the international community wanna do this every year? And now this year, this winter, um, uh, food prices are gonna be higher. Um, the Ukraine crisis is there. You know, We don't know what else is coming down the pike. So sustainability is a real issue. Donor fatigue has been an issue for a very long time in Afghanistan. We know that humanitarian aid alone is not going to fix this. And we also know that it's not going to come in the ways that the, that, that the Afghans need. And so that's why our focus at Unfreeze Afghanistan has been on unfreezing the assets that Afghanistan has, releasing the banking sector and the commercial uh, activities from the chokehold that it has. Uh, although the United States has uh, issued those general licenses and encouraged um, banking activity, it's still not enough. Um, banks are generally afraid to transfer money. Individuals, NGOs, et cetera, are afraid. There used to be a billion dollars of remittances coming from the diaspora community to Afghanistan as well. Um, yeah. That's additionally reduced. Uh, and the numbers aren't clear, but it, it may be $500 million so far. I don't know what the annual will be, but I don't think it will be um, as high as, as it needs to be or as high as a billion dollars as it used to be. Um, so, so the focus then comes back to where the areas that the, that the world uh, can help, you know, what kind of engagement is necessary. You know, we've been using a lot of sticks with this interim administration, not a lot of carrots. It's not clear, and despite all the, 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 the discussions uh, that are happening and, and US Special Representative Tom West has been doing a really good job now engaging regionally. He was in Uzbekistan, he was just in Turkey meeting with Afghans. Um, I believe he's co he's coming back to this region. Um, the UAE government has engaged with the Taliban now. Um, they uh, have signed an agreement for the operations of the of several of the airports in Afghanistan, and visas will start again with the UAE from Afghanistan to the UAE. So there is some construction constructive engagement starting again, but not enough. Um, there is right. you know not a diplomatic presence in the uh, in Afghanistan by the U.S. Um, and the meetings in Qatar, it's, you know, when you look at the engagement, first of all, it's, it's very limited right now since the girls' school issue. And second of all, um, you're not getting the high-level uh, senior Afghan interim administration engagement. You want that engagement because you don't want to just have occasional meetings on these issues. The world needs Afghanistan to be engaged with. Afghan people need the world to stay engaged. Um, and so that's another thing we've been pushing. Back to the... To the um, Nine billion, nine billion, nine and a half billion dollars of, of money that is needed for the liquidity of the banking system and for the stabilization of prices, uh, currency auctions. There's a lawsuit in the United States for half of the $7 billion of the central bank funds. Um, uh, Unfreeze Afghanistan has filed an amicus brief in that lawsuit um, to discuss the ways in which that money is needed for the Afghan central bank, um, as I mentioned, price stability, uh, banking, yeah. liquidity, and otherwise. Um, and I sense that I'm, I'm, uh, I should stop here. You might want to, uh, I'm sensing that you might want to say something. Sure, no, Masuda, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for that very comprehensive analysis. Um, I was just cognizant of the fact that you had a limited amount of time with us today. So I wanted to make sure that that time was not violated. Um, a range of things we've already discussed. We've discussed things uh, related to the economy. We've discussed things related to you know, the GL-12, the, the girls' education issue, the fact that the international appetite following the invasion of Ukraine um, has also diminished significantly. But security is one angle that we've not particularly touched upon. 
Uh, I was in fact reminded uh, today by a colleague on Twitter that today marks the fifth anniversary of that devastating attack in Kabul um, using an oil tanker that took the lives of close to 200 individuals and injured nearly twice as many um, others. Uh, the big piece of news today, though, uh, for Pakistan was the announcement of the indefinite ceasefire. Shariar and I were speaking about this a little bit earlier. These ceasefires have happened before. They've been violated before. Uh, most security analysts, myself included, don't really make much of it. Um, David, I'll come to you, uh, given your background in terms of you know monitoring a lot of these groups and looking at some of these situations. Uh, the TTP swore allegiance to the Taliban uh, after August 15th. Following this, there's been a dramatic uptick in attacks and violence across Pakistan. Uh, by December, most security think tanks, uh, their reports indicated that there was an upsurge of roughly 42% year over year. And this is the first time the graph went up since 2016. Since 2016, it had been on a downward sort of decline. Uh, the conversation is that a gridlock. Uh, how do you see the security situation, uh, particularly related with the TTP, uh, across the border, inside Pakistan, um, over the next several months? And, and uh, related to that, or, or sort of concatenated with that, is the question of what does this, all of this say for the international demand, including from Pakistan, uh, for the Taliban to not allow their soil to be used um, by any one of these terror outfits, and perhaps more importantly, if that capacity even exists with the Taliban. Thanks a lot, Susan. Uh, and I also want to, to thank the Battle Lab for, for, for the invitation. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, from 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 where uh, I am, I'm sitting. I'm finding it very hard to t to talk of uh, of the Taliban as uh, as a as a unified group. Uh, I think that the development that, that we have seen uh, over, over the last uh, two years actually is is only going in 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 one direction, uh, and I. I I also see that there are so many different uh, agendas among uh, among groups uh, within the the Taliban uh, umbrella uh, that that clearly has uh, has an uh, an an incentive to to continue this fighting and I also see think that that's why we we see this uh, this this increase in in attacks in uh, in Pakistan uh, and and also I, I think that that this underlines uh, the fact that that there are also uh, there are different uh, visions or uh, uh, interests uh, within uh, within uh, the Taliban and I also think that the legislation provided so far also just uh, underlines this uh, because uh, lo looking back uh, almost nine nine months ago, when, when you saw the, the statements made by especially the uh, the, uh, the Doha office and and, and Mullah Barada, uh, I mean it, they they painted a, a totally different uh, picture uh, of of the political development in uh, in Afghanistan that that than we have seen. Uh, but I, I just think it's 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 very important to 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 focus on what drives uh, the uh, the Taliban inside uh, Afghanistan now and i think that the key point uh, has been since 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 august last year to try to to keep the movement or even the idea of a united movement uh, together uh, and and when you have a a collapsed uh, economy uh, and and things will only uh, um, only uh, be 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 worse. Uh, then you need to find some kind of of common uh, denominator. Uh, you need to also send a signal, especially to uh, to the groups that have done the, most of the fight o over the last two decades. That that things uh, things have changed, and this is a new uh, Afghanistan that, that we are looking into. And the only tool they have. I think there's a bit of a connectivity issue, perhaps on David's end. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I for a second, I but I think you. you're back. Uh, okay, I, it looks like Sishan have a connectivity problem. Quite okay. possible. 
Okay, I'll I'll just uh, I'll just uh, continue. Um, so 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 the reason why we we are um, we we are looking into this uh, this increase in in terror attacks, I, I think it's 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 quite uh, logical uh, because um, the uh, the glue that that kept uh, these groups uh, within the the the, the Taliban uh, umbrella over the last two decades was was was, was the common enemy, whether that was uh, Western troops or or the or, or the Afghan National Army. Uh, the problem is now that that many of these groups and and especially uh the uh, the commanders within these groups they they will continue to look for uh for funding uh and if the taliban cannot provide then they will look for 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 other ways to to finance their uh their their, their local uh agendas uh so unfortunately i i think that that, that what we are uh what we are seeing right now is uh is the 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 the, uh, the steps or the continued steps uh, toward what what I think will will be an, a new uh, a new Afghan uh, civil war and I also think that that when you look at the uh, when you look at the at the position that the international community have taken especially uh, the West and 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 China I I, I think that this pretty much underlines uh, underlines this uh, analysis uh, because they are in a, in a in a in a waiting position and i don't think at all that they are convinced that that this uh, taliban uh, regime uh, will be able to to keep things together uh, maybe not even uh, for for the for the for, for a year yeah, thank you, David. And you know, this is something that Sharyar also mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, and I would say that while I do agree with uh, the bulk of your analysis, at the end of the day, when it comes to higher level decision making, irrespective of whether the commander is accepted or not, or whether or not the you know the various factions within the Taliban uh, all agree with it or not, the decision making power does belong to the the Kandahar group at the at the, at the very top. Um, and that is what the international community is perhaps for, first and foremost concerned with because that has a ripple effect of long-term and long-scale implementation across. Uh, I'll come to you now. Uh, we've spoken quite a bit about uh, Taliban, the sanctions that have been placed on them, the GL20, how that has eased some of these restrictions. But that doesn't change the fact that the Afghanistan bank is still very much in, in disarray. And what I'm interested in knowing, um, especially since Masuda is no longer with us, uh, are what are some of the knockover effects, you know, or, or what you could call secondary sanctions that directly then go and affect the Afghan people as a result of, of, um, of all this? And, and how, can, how can the international community sort of support grassroots level How do we build confidence uh, for the banking sector to be able to engage uh, within that space? Uh, and what is the role of the multilateral forum in, in all of this? Thank you so much uh, for having me in, and thank you so much for the panel. I uh, learned a lot from listening to them. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that Afghanistan uh, was already experiencing multiple crises before uh, the Taliban takeover. Uh, the poverty rate was rising, um, even uh, uh, hunger was a serious issue. The country was also experiencing a liquidity crisis. Uh, the value of uh, Afghani was, the Afghan currency was uh, being devalued. Um, it was at the time mostly attributed to the ongoing war in the country, the brutal insurgency that the Taliban conducted, um, and also the failure of the Afghan government, the corruption that was, uh, uh, endemic throughout the whole host of institutions. Um, on top of that, the, the gradual withdrawal of uh, foreign forces that started 2014, not uh, uh, right before the Taliban uh, uh, takeover, um, that had also uh, limited uh, the number, the amount of money that was available inside the country. So these are like longer term trends. Some of them have deep institutional kind of uh, uh, roots to them. Uh, but once Taliban took over, everything got much worse uh, uh, for a host of, whole host of reasons. One was just the Afghanistan economy was so much dependent on foreign money, and suddenly all those 
taps were turned off, the money stopped coming in, and the, con the economy kind of went into shock. Um, according to the uh, World Bank estimate, almost 30% of the GDP was lost um, in matters of, 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 of days. Um, also, Taliban is a sanctioned group. Um, many individuals within the Taliban are sanctioned. Taliban as a group is sanctioned. Haqqani, which is, uh, according at least to the US, is a faction, faction within the Taliban, was sanctioned. And now all those people were in charge of the whole uh, state apparatus, were in charge of the economy, were in charge of the regulatory institutions like the central bank that were supposed to regulate the entire banking system. And in effect, those san sanctions meant that the entire Afghan economy was blacklisted, um, in effect, even though the, co the country as a jurisdiction was never sanctioned. Uh, since then, uh, and those kind of exacerbated that those effects exacerbated already existing an institutional uh, economic uh, crisis in the country. There has been a liquidity crisis, basically meaning there's not enough money in circulation for people to be able to pay for goods and services. Um, that applies to Afghani, the national currency that is needed to actually grease the economic transactions and make sure exchanges can happen easily. It also applies to foreign currency, which Afghanistan badly need to import uh, the necessity, uh, the necessity of life, because Afghanistan is very much import dependent. As you know, Pakistan is a major trade partner. Afghanistan imports a lot through Pakistan and from Pakistan, and there have been issues with regard to making payments to uh, exporters. Like in Afghan importers have had a problem paying their suppliers outside because they have been cut off from the financial system. So there has been a disruption in supply chains. There has been a liquidity crisis, both in terms of Afghani and foreign currency. Uh, there's been also, uh, uh, as you pointed out, the, the whole financial system has been cut off, meaning Afghans, uh, the banking system, there was a ran on the bank. So the banks were under a lot of distress. Afghans who had money and savings in the bank could no longer access them. There were limits put in how much people could withdraw. Uh, that those limits are still in place. People have been struggling to withdraw their money. Businesses have been struggling to access the money they had in the banks, right? That's, that's an extra shock to the businesses. Um, but also on top of this, the central bank of the country has been struggling to actually conduct monetary policy, uh, which is basically what central banks do to make sure that when there's a shock like this, the impact on consumer is mitigated. What they do, for example, is they inject uh, current, uh, current inject money into the economy to make sure the inflation is not as bad, um, or they sometimes buy foreign currency from the market to make sure that the the national currency maintains. Uh, 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 they they sell uh, foreign currency into the market to make sure the national currency maintains some of its values, meaning people don't lose purchasing power. Obviously, all those monetary tools are temporary. They're just meant to smooth things. But they were extremely important at a time of crisis like this. And they could also signal confidence. It could signal that the, someone was in charge and the economy was not in free fall. But the central bank could not do any of that because it lacked funding that it needed to do uh, those tasks. It basically uh, went bankrupt because all of its funds um, that, it, that were marked for this purpose were out of Afghanistan. They were in. They are in Europe and the United States, and they were frozen as a result of sanctions. Since then, um, so there were some act actions taken to mitigate all of these crises. Multiple crises were going on uh, already. Uh, we talked about the general exemptions given to make sure that there, some transaction could take place. With regard to the frozen assets, um, there has been not major development in terms of actually making sure the central bank has access to those. But there's been a lot of USD. Um, I think the current estimate is close to $1 billion being physically shipped into the country. And it finds some its way to the banking system uh, and into the market. It's a very convoluted way, and there are still a lot of restrictions and inefficiencies and such. But that USD finds its way through the, uh, through the market. And that has helped maintain the value of Afghani. That has helped um, Afghanistan economy to get even worse. But it is not going to the normal kind of uh, routes that the central, uh, 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 the normal processes that the central bank would actually control. I will stop here if uh, you have any questions. Sure. Thank you, Harun. Uh, I and I agree. You know, I've I've heard harrowing stories from on the ground about the rapid decline in purchasing power, about how commodities are available in the markets. 
but people don't necessarily have the money to to purchase them. And, and yes, you know, uh, Shariar's point is valid in that the large scale of famine that at one point was feared has been avoided, but that does not change the fact that the situation on the ground is very, very dire. Um, Sara, I'll come to you now because I think you have a very unique perspective that most other panelists uh, might not be able to give us here. Um, and this is sort of the question that I also asked Masuda partially, uh, especially considering that you know you're engaging in the sort of the civic technology sort of sector. Um, my question to you is: How difficult do you find it to triangulate information from inside of Afghanistan? Um, and how do you see uh, you know civic technology specifically, some of the work that you're doing, um, other things that you've seen, making up for the delta in terms of information, both collation and dissemination, that might be critical, um, as 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 uh, as uh, some of the panelists said, especially for building some internal pressure uh, to be able to reverse some of the decisions that have been taken by the Taliban government. I muted myself. Thank you so much again. So sorry for that. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, right away, I just want to um, highlight two things. One is um, the previous panelist had mentioned that we have been working with the Taliban, providing them sticks, and we should be providing them carrots. I think that's an extremely dangerous narrative. We have given more than sticks to the Taliban. And as uh, Professor Rahimi had just said, we have extremely stringent sanctions on the Taliban now. So this, uh, this assumption that the world has not been working with the Taliban is false. And uh, the Taliban uh, administration uh, needs to uh, come to reality on that, that um, the reneging of the March 23rd uh, law on women's education, on girls' education, reneging that has had um, worldwide implications affecting specifically the Afghan people. And uh, we can no longer have this conversation that uh, the world hasn't tried to engage with the Taliban. They have sanctions. Uh, they have been given many chances to uh, work with the international community, especially with uh, certain requirements for aid. Uh, and they have continuously uh, decided not to um, go through with those uh, policies. So um, th this, this narrative that we need to be providing them more then sticks is um, quite dangerous. Um, now, coming on to the um, topic of how we're engaging with uh, those in Afghanistan, the everyday Afghan, uh, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Bilal Sarwari, as many of you may know who that is, one of um, our most notable journalists who has been a journalist in Afghanistan for, for I, I believe, almost two decades now. Um, I had asked him about his opinion on SMS because I have this concern that eventually the Taliban will disconnect the world from Afghanistan. And many uh, people were suggesting me that right now you're sending alerts to Afghan users through smartphones. You may want to shift to SMS because there's going to be a less of a, a use of smartphones. Actually, we're seeing the opposite. As um, um, Sarah Saib had told me, uh, more uh, you'll find smartphones in the smallest, most rural villages across Afghanistan uh, because they are realizing that it's one of the few ways to, to be connected and actually even more so now during the Taliban regime. So um, I'm, I'm glad that I had that conversation with him because it just shows such interesting shifts uh, within the country. And when it comes to those um, those demographics at this point, we have seen a spike in the users and the reports that we're getting. For example, I've just noted four. In the last four days straight, we've received reports on an explosion in Kandahar market. We've received a report on uh, a lack of assistance with traffic maneuvering and uh, really dangerous traffic uh, situations right now in Kabul. Uh, electricity prices, um, price hiking, corruption within um, DABs, the uh, Brishna Shirkat that's providing electricity. Um, another explosion in Hotel Esteplal, a car that was attacked. The, the Nimroz border, a lot of issues. Users sending us uh, reports from Nimroz, which is, you know, um, um, right in the south of, of Afghanistan. These are reports that were sent to us from Afghans. They're not from journalists. They're not from uh, security experts. They are from uh, citizens themselves. So us having this collaboration means everything to us for us to be able to provide a platform 
for Afghans to be able to uh, share this information it is extremely important to us and to support that. And uh, we're just going to keep um, supporting this movement of reminding Afghans that there are um, youth and other Afghans who are trying to ensure that transparency and accountability is still there. And our main focus is to ensure that there's a platform for as many Afghans to share what's truly going on on the ground and not just to be taken over by narratives of those who don't actually feel the pain of being a Muslim right now. Thank you, Sarah. I think just the fact that you've relayed so many of these incidents reported to you just within the last four days very much underlines the significant delta that exists between the knowledge that the international community has and what might actually be going on inside of Afghanistan. And I think a big portion of it has to do with Sharyar's point earlier. Uh, the first thing that he raised, which was the Feb 24th uh, Ukraine invasion. We just conducted a policy roundtable last week on Ukraine. Um, and one of the things that, of course, we discussed in detail uh, was the knockover effect of the appetite, especially for the global north, getting significantly reduced in engaging in uh, the global south uh, uh, a part of the world and, and, and sort of the many issues that plague um, that region. Um, and, you know, in the service of that, uh, David, I'll come to you. Uh, for a long time, the SEO and by extension China has maintained that, you know, this is a Western created, uh, Western exacerbated, uh, Western centric problem, and they are the ones who have to step in to fix it, whatever that fix may be. But now with the Ukraine war having entered its fourth month and there being no signs of that particular conflict slowing down anytime soon, and by extension thereby, the appetite for the global north not really shifting its focus anytime soon, um, is it now in the interest of China and of SEO to see a stable, uh, you know, sort of economically connected Afghanistan? And what, if any at all, role do you feel the SEO should be able to play to create sort of this mutually beneficial, uh, sustainable dynamic for this entire region, especially considering their overall plans with the BRI? I think that, that, that in, in all circumstances, um, um, the, uh, I mean, initiatives on on, on of, of stability in 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 Afghanistan will, will have to uh, will have to evolve from uh, from the region. Uh, I, I think that was the case in all circumstances, but but the crisis in Ukraine has simply underlined this uh, and. I mean, I can I can just uh, I, I can just view it from from my own uh, uh, perspective in the in the in the global north. But but uh, the, the the security uh, policies driving uh, drive driving right now uh, is of course all related to Ukraine and and uh, and and other states in the, in the in the East U European area and I, and I also think that there will be a general uh, shift in Europe to, towards uh, towards uh, their uh, their near areas uh, and and territorial uh, defense and and future uh, our missions and operations on on stabilization will also be focused on uh, capacity building training uh, and 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 other kind of support to uh, to 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 areas uh, with that aim uh, that said i um, i still think that uh, that that afghanistan uh, middle east and and other uh, fragile uh, areas uh, will, will still have the eyes of uh, of europe and i think that that europe will be able able to support uh, support uh, initiatives uh, but but initiatives will have to come from from the region uh, itself and and of course I understand the the, the, the perspective from uh, from China from the region that in in many uh, in many aspects uh, the West and, and especially the the, the, the financial uh, policy towards aiding Afghanistan has has created this problem especially um, especially when, when when it's cut in the manner that that, that was the case last year uh, but uh, but still, uh, I, I, I think that also, as I mentioned uh, before, that that uh, Europe is ready to support, but it will oh, it will support uh, initiatives that ha that will e evolve from from the region, uh, and we might also need to to consider maybe it, it 
it does not necessarily have to be national initiatives. Uh, there are also other ways to support stability uh, in Afghanistan. And I especially think that if we look at the uh, the next few years, uh, I think that that going for a, a national support uh, is almost uh, impossible. So, so I would uh, I would advise uh, to to look at more regional and and local uh, support initiatives. Agreed, David. I think as time goes on, and especially as the one year benchmark appro approaches, it's becoming increasingly apparent that the recognition issue is more or less completely off the table. Um, I also read recently that there's a there's 13 or 14 embassies that are now operating inside of Kabul, which for all intents and purposes implies that the international community is engaging with the Taliban, conducting business with the Taliban, holding high level talks without there necessarily being a formal recognition of their government or their structure. Um, Sharia, we had a brief conversation a little bit earlier about um, you know, the fact that back in January when we conducted the Afghan Solution Summit, we tried to talk a little bit about what are some of the positive things that might be coming out of this. And of course, back then, the March 23rd decision had not happened. The Ukraine invasion had not happened, um, among many, many other things. The, the decree regarding uh, uh, females being in complete burqa, the, uh, uh, the restrictions on mobility had not, had not taken place up, up until that point. But now that we are at this particular stage in time. Uh, one of the things that was touted as a good positive development was the Afghan ban, uh, the Afghan Taliban's ban on the narcotics trade. And while that seems like a positive development, the truth, it seems, uh, is not necessarily as clear cut. Uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. And related to that, is there anything positive for us to look forward to? Um, any good development that might be coming out of this entire situation? Uh, Mike, shut down your mics off. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, with respect to the poppy ban that was announced on April 3rd, in assessing its prospect, it's important to understand the role of poppy in the Afghan economy. This is a drought resistant crop. It's a labor intensive, uh, it, its cultivation is extremely labor intensive. It has more than one harvest. Uh, you know, the, the buyers buy the paste, the opium paste, directly from the farmers. Uh, loans are available for the farmers. The land is available for farm hands. So it, it is a very, very convenient and uh, indeed lucrative uh, crop to be cultivating. Now, a lot of uh, attention, understandably, was, was given and praise given to the Taliban in the first emirate when it banned poppy. Uh, I, you know, would like to add a word of caution here that the uh, ban that took place from July 2000 to October 2001 was really too short to uh, be able to assess what its long term prospects were would have been and whether it would have sustained political support. Um, now, in, at a time of economic isolation, economic collapse, to take away uh, a crop that has sustained uh, the rural economy, especially in the, in, in the South, uh, is a very bold move. And, um, you know, there, there's um, suspicions that, uh, that the intention is not really to stop it, but it is to find another vehicle towards international legitimacy and engagement which might have also been the motivation the first time around, which is to say that, look, you guys are worried about drugs showing up on your streets. We are imposing a ban, but to be able to implement this ban, we need help, we need engagement. The timing is also relevant. Uh, the ban was announced at a time when the harvest in the South was already underway. So a lot this year has already been harvested. And from my conversations with um, security officials and, and people who keep close watch of this, there's a lot already sort of ready for traffickers to move across uh, the border, particularly the Pakistan, Afghanistan border. So, uh, so that's one, you know, that's, that's one issue. The other issue is that the, unlike the first time around, the Taliban's relationship to poppy cultivation has evolved significantly during these, the 20 year insurgency, where it sustained the insurgency, particularly through taxing uh, farmers and uh, and others all along the supply chain. 
So the relationship has changed. And to now expect uh, local commanders at a time when they're not getting other sources of revenue to, uh, to, a sense, to, to back off, I think is expecting a little too much. I ultimately don't have high hopes for uh, the Taliban's ability to enforce this ban. And sorry, Shari, yeah, just uh, the follow-up question to that, which was, is there anything positive for us to sort of look forward to? It's difficult to see. And, you know, picking up from uh, Sarah's very uh, excellent and poignant uh, comments, uh, it's worth framing in this way. Afghanistan is not just going through a humanitarian crisis. It's not just going through an economic crisis. It's also going through a human rights crisis. And that human rights crisis is... In, in intertwined with these other crises. And without movement here, uh, it's unlikely that the international appetite for addressing those first two problems uh, is going to be anywhere near where Afghanistan uh, needs it. So especially with the, the recent developments and decisions that the Taliban has made, I don't see much reason for hope. A lot of the um, you know, you mentioned the innovative approaches to dealing with the liquidity crisis, and there have been some. I mean, the international community has found creative ways to get money in uh, through uh, currency swaps between UN agencies and, and businesses. There's an attempt to formalize that in uh, what is called a humanitarian exchange facility. Uh, but these are all short-term stopgap measures, and until... Um, the international community is convinced of the Taliban's seriousness on the human rights front. I just don't see great prospects. I think uh, one of the terms that I've used for this before, uh, especially at the international stage, is this is effectively a very a giant game of geopolitical chicken. It's, it's, it's basically looking at who is going to blink first, who will capitulate first. Unfortunately, what the Ukraine invasion has done is that one of the players in this game of chicken has simply stepped away from the board. Um, and in the absence of the Taliban softening their stance on some of these these issues, uh, I, I agree with you in that I don't really see any immediate uh, good news coming out of Afghanistan, at least in the short to medium term, but perhaps something a little further down the line. Uh, Dr. Rahimi, I'll, I'll come to you now. I think we know very well, uh, given Sarah's very vibrant response to the, the stick and carrot analogy, uh, what her stance on this is. But the question then does remain, uh, as far as the international community is concerned, are there any concessions that should be provided to the Taliban to soften their stance on issues um, that currently prevent their rec recognition? Because it very much seems to me to be a chicken and egg situation. Uh, there's, that, there's the second chicken analogy of the, of the, of the policy roundtable. But the, the fact of the matter remains that it seems like this sort of vicious downward spiral that nobody is really going to take a step back. And in the process of that, the people that suffer the most are, of course, of course the people of Afghanistan. That is very, very much true. The way I see it, um, and I'm certainly very humble about my opinion on this because it's an extremely complicated situation. Um, we have very limited tool to influence Taliban whether it be with sticks or carrots, to be honest. I mean, um, Taliban have proven that they can survive under extreme conditions. Uh, in the 90s, they were kind of a prior state. Um, they ruled over um, Afghanistan in ruins, and they managed to hold on to power. Um, over the past uh, uh, 20 years, they were able to uh, uh, remain a cohesive force, and they were able to... Uh, um, basically keep together despite maximum pressure at different stages. Uh, so, and that's kind of the the, the uh, stick part of it. The carrot part of it, um, it seems like there's not much that the world can offer them that would change their uh, uh, domestic policies. Um, for example, the girls' education, the whole, war, the whole world was in consensus. Uh, regional countries, the international community was saying that this is like the basic expectation that you need to meet for us to be able to move forward. And the um, Taliban leadership decided to keep the school closed, despite the fact that there is a vocal uh, group of critics inside the Taliban. Many ulama, many religious scholars from inside Afghanistan, from the region, came out and said, this has nothing to do with Islam. Don't do this. I mean, you could think that all the possible um, carrots were there and all the things were in the right place for the girls' education to reopen and Taliban had signaled that they could, but they didn't, right? Uh, they, they would and they didn't, right? So just 
tells me that there's very limited kind of opportunity to influence Taliban. Sadly, it is going to come down to the Taliban's domestic politics, who are the stakeholders inside the group, uh, their competitions, uh, the, any change in, in the way different groups may have. And that, sadly, is not where a lot of Afghans, the majority of Afghans or the international community can uh, exert a lot of influence. Regional countries may be different story. Um, Pakistan and Iran have may have relationships with insiders, um, and they may have an influence. I'm not an expert in this area. I will not comment. But what to do now, as you said, like, okay, this the reality is what it is, what to do. My thinking is that we need to approach a no, no harm, we need to take a no harm approach first, meaning that there should not be things done just so we be doing things. Uh, and that's the kind of a fear with uh, uh, humanitarian only response, because throwing money into Afghanistan, uh, wasting money without any uh, oversight, without any assurances that the money is gonna actually solve any fundamental problem, beyond the basic humanitarian needs um, could be a repeating the scenario of the past 20 years. Just uh, a lot of money with very little result that could actually make things work, could, worse could lead to corruption and empower bad actors and all of that. Um, and also um, beyond this no harm approach, just see what are the areas that we can make things better and Taliban are willing to uh, cooperate. It seems like the op I mean, the poppy ban could be an area that could be convergence. And I don't think it's because the Taliban are responding to any international reactions, to be honest. I think it's driven by internal dynamics um, that may not be may not be pervy to. And there are other areas that Taliban may be willing to, on their own terms, to engage. And I think the international community should stand ready to engage in areas that would make things better for the uh, ordinary Afghans. But in terms of hoping that we can change fundamentals of the, the situation in the country to any forms of carrots and sticks, I haven't seen any indication that it is actually possible. And just humility, I think, would be a good lesson that there are things that we cannot control. Um, and we are at the mercy of Taliban's internal dynamics, um, at least for, for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Dr. Rahim. I mean, I think uh, inadvertently or advertently, perhaps, you have triggered the final part of the conversation this evening. We'll just go over maybe five minutes or so, a little over time. Um, but you, you spoke about some of the solutions, right? That the no harm policy being the central factor with which we should approach all of this. And I would now request all of my panelists, starting with David, uh, to perhaps share two or three key recommendations, key solutions that the international community should bear in mind, prioritizing the Afghan people, while at the same time, as Dr. Rahimi said, ensuring that there's no harm um, as, the, as the central clause. Thank you, Shishan. Uh, I'll try to be as, as briefly as uh, as uh, as possible. Um, uh, I think that that for 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 twenty years uh, the West tried to solve this through a a, a, a national uh, approach. Uh, and, and my key recommendation would be to move away from this national uh, approach. I think that there is a a diplomatic regional uh, approach. Uh, especially looking, uh, looking, uh, looking at, at 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 Pakistan, also I Iran, uh, that 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 where where there are avenues of of cooperation that can be uh, exploited uh, through cooperation between Europe and and uh, and especially Pakistan, but in uh, in 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 the future maybe also uh, the the other neighbor. Uh, the other thing would be to. To, to go to the to to, to a more local uh, approach uh, look at uh, look at uh, different provinces different groups uh, where things can actually uh, things can actually improve through either engagement or uh, or financial uh, financial support to 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 different projects and uh, and 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 my final advice would be uh, be careful to to not to Broadcast these uh, advices uh, too 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 loudly. Uh, try try to to work as much as possible uh, in the shadows, especially uh, in the in the next years uh, in, in next year to come. Because what we have seen uh, in the last six years is that the more uh, that the Taliban uh, regime is pressured, uh, the worse uh, legislation uh, will be uh, laid out. No, I agree. It's almost as if the reaction to any kind of a push is actually significantly worse than what would have been had that push not been there. Um, Sharia, I'll come to you now with final recommendations. 
Well, I'm going to uh, echo what David said about uh, going local. I think a broad sort of national, you know, all everything in one package approach uh, is, is just not going to work. The visions are just too, there's too much discrepancy between them. Uh, but there might be opportunities at the more local level with some uh, local commanders a bit more accommodating on this issue and that issue. Um, I think that the, uh, the World Bank's decision to repurpose uh, over a billion dollars of the Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund is positive. Uh, my recommendation would be in uh, plans to uh, disperse that money, uh, engaging local staff, local uh, organizations, CSOs, NGOs, make sure that there is Afghan uh, influence and input in the design of how this money is going to be spent is crucial. And finally, um, you know, I, I think that um, I, I'm not entirely certain how you would go about this, but understanding the, the new Afghan economy a little bit better uh, through, to the extent possible, you know, research uh, on the ground about how the Taliban uh, conceives the Afghan economy, what its intentions and capacity, is, you know, are, uh, and, and use that as sort of a foundation for, uh, for you know, future engagement. Thank you, Sharyan. Uh, and I knew eventually you would find some positive element in there somewhere vis-a-vis -vis the World Bank's uh, restructuring. And that's why I kept asking you that question. I'm glad that you finally got there. Um, I'll go finally to Sara Vahidi. You have the last word. Thank you so much. Um, the first thing I want to bring up was a very poignant point that Professor Rahimi brought up, which is throwing money into Afghanistan without any benchmark, without any structure is extremely dangerous. Right now, and I understand the unfreeze movement, but we have to be realistic here. Are we assuming that if we put funnel in $9 billion into an, a Talib government, we can be ensured that that money will be accounted for? That, that begs a question. So that's the first thing that I wanted to bring up. The second one is, um, for me personally, I, I work specifically in civic technology. As Fazli Sab had just mentioned, if you're going to work with CSOs and NGOs, number one, of course, you want to make sure that you have the the, the Afghan uh, narrative and voices a part of that conversation, a part of the solution, but also ensuring their protection. CSOs and NGOs are very frightened to work with the international community because they are being targeted, uh, their money is being taken away from them, there is very uh, little framework for them to do their work. Um, support them if you're will, if you're wanting to work with Afghans make sure that you're able to protect them and you're able to monitor their work so they don't feel like they're alone there are many Afghans who wish to work but they also don't want to uh, put their lives and their own families lives in danger so there needs to be uh, certain uh, frameworks in place for the international community to work around uh, the, the current uh, Talib government and and uh, like other panelists had, had said, I want to echo that as well, that it, it cannot be national anymore because uh, national really doesn't make sense. Um, national means just the, 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 the crux of the Talib government. So it has to be very specific um, projects and initiatives that highlight the work of uh, groups that have been doing it for the last 20 years. Um, and also, lastly, uh, any projects to support Afghans to be able to safely provide their opinions, reports, uh, human rights violations. We need this more than ever. Um, for example, the human rights special rapporteur, Mr. Bennett, had just been in Afghanistan. He was unable to go to Panjshir. Um, and this is because it's becoming more and more difficult to get information on the ground. So if there are groups out there who are willing to work with technologists, who are working to willing to work with those who are in innovation, we need their support more than ever because eventually, like many others have said, uh, the Taliban's um, uh, next interest will be to completely shut off Afghanistan from the world and to in, in, um, to increase their encroachment um, on um, uh, the freedoms that, that Afghans have been fighting for uh, and have been entrenched for the last two decades. But these are the, the few points that I, can, that I can bring up. Great, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I have to say, uh, conducting these policy roundtables is always a very humbling experience because you think by virtue of having worked on Afghanistan for several years, you know a lot. But then you come across people like Sheria Fazli and Dr. Harun Rahimi and David Vestenskov and Sarah Wahidi. 
and Masood al-Sultan who was with us a little bit earlier and you realize there's a lot more for you to learn, a lot more for you to understand. And the deeper you dive into the, the conversation, the more complex the interconnections become. Um, I want to thank all of my panelists very sincerely for not only sparing their time this evening, but for uh, enlightening us with such valuable, well-informed and structured thoughts uh, on the various aspects that plague uh, Afghanistan today. Uh, this has been at the Badlai Policy Roundtable. Uh, my name is Zishan Salahuddin. I wish you well and hope to see you soon. Khudafiz and take care.